Well, good morning. Uh, as Pastor Aaron mentioned, I am going to be speaking from uh, Luke 19, which is the story of Zacchaeus. Very familiar story, and yet uh, the longer I've been sitting with it and pondering it and praying over it, the more I realize how many layers there are to this short passage in Luke. And I'm not going to go into all the layers this morning. We just, is no, not going to get into all the layers. I'm just going to focus on the main point of, uh, of what I believe God is uh, wanting me to share with you this morning. So uh, Luke 19, verses 1 to 10. Oh, and I didn't put it in there. Is it up there? Sorry. I forgot to put it in Planning Center. Thank you. <laughs> Jesus entered Jer Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So far the reading of God's word. Let's just pray briefly one more time. Lord Jesus, as we open your word today, I pray that you will open our hearts to hear what you would have to say. And may we be changed by our encounter with you this morning. And I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart may be pleasing to you. pray this in your name. Amen. So this morning, I am uh, just using a little bit of what we call sometimes holy imagination. So little did Zacchaeus know that particular morning that by the end of the day, his entire world, his entire world view, his entire philosophy of life, his belief system and way of living would be completely turned upside down. All he had wanted to do was see Jesus as he passed through the city. He was curious about this man who piqued the interest of the people, who was drawing people away from their regular work and routine in order to follow him, who apparently went around healing the blind and lame, who, the people were saying, was the one promised by Yahweh, by God, through the prophets, the Messiah, the one who redeemed the Jewish people, who had become king in the great line of King David, and save them from their enemies. So Zacchaeus was curious. Wouldn't you be? And Zacchaeus reasoned that as chief tax collector for the city of Jericho, wasn't it important for him to learn more about this person who everyone was talking about? Or so he told himself as he went out that morning. But going out to see Jesus wasn't going to be that easy. The crowds around Jesus were thick, and they were not about to give way to allow a tax collector, a cheap tax collector at that, through. The people despised him, and for good reason. He had become very wealthy off the backs of the very people surrounding Jesus. But he was far too short to see over the crowd. So what was he to do? 
Zacchaeus wasn't about to give up. He hadn't become chief tax collector by giving up when things got difficult. He was a determined and resourceful person. I know, he thought, I'll run up ahead and climb that big sycamore fig tree along the route Jesus will be walking. And off he went. He didn't stop to consider that someone in his position never ran, let alone exposed himself to possible mockery by climbing a tree. No, all he could think about was his desire to see Jesus and what he needed to do to make that happen. Zacchaeus didn't really know why he felt so strongly. He just knew that he had to see Jesus. What drove him, he wasn't sure. Besides, if he ran ahead and climbed the tree quickly enough, perhaps no one would even notice him. He could hide amongst the leaves and still have a great view as Jesus walked past. So off Zacchaeus goes, running up the street and shinning up a sycamore fig tree. Just in time, too. Here comes Jesus, along with the crowd of people surrounding him. As Jesus came closer, Zacchaeus tried to see what it was about Jesus that so drew people to him. And he felt a bit of a stab of disappointment. Jesus certainly didn't look very special. His clothes were basic, very ordinary, certainly not nearly as good quality as his own. There was nothing to indicate that Jesus was someone special. Yet the crowd seemed to be hanging on his every word. Jesus, uh, Zacchaeus had assumed that Jesus would simply pass beneath the tree and keep on going. But to his astonishment, Jesus stopped directly below him, looked up, and said, Zacchaeus, come down. I must stay at your house today. For a split second, Zacchaeus stared at Jesus incomprehensibly, a swirl of thoughts and feelings running through him. Jesus knew his name. Jesus wanted to come to his house? Really? To stay and eat with him? An outcast Jewish person? Outcast and unclean, not fit for faithful Jewish people to associate with, and certainly not fit to attend the synagogue and be in the presence of God. And in a flash, Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus recognized why people were so drawn to Jesus. There was a power to Jesus' presence, to his gaze, that simply drew people in. A look in Jesus' eyes that said, I know you, the real you, and I still want to be in relationship with you. Zacchaeus' heart pounded as his life flashed before his eyes and his world tilted. Unexpected joy filled his heart as he jumped down from the tree. Yes, Jesus, please come and stay at my house. And as Zacchaeus started to walk with Jesus toward his house, he couldn't help asking questions. Are you really the Messiah, the Savior, the one that Yahweh, God, promised in the prophets so long ago? Are you sure it's my house that you need to stay at today? You sure you want to stay there? You do know that I am the chief tax collector for Jericho, right? People must have talked about me. After all, you know my name. You must know none of my fellow Jews will talk with me on the street, let alone come to my house and eat and stay with me. You do know I'm considered unclean. You know you'll be unclean if you stay at my house and eat with me. You know that, right? Smiling, Jesus answered, Yes, I am aware others will consider me unclean. And yes, I must stay at your house tonight. Zacchaeus felt like he would burst with joy. Jesus, the promised one, wanted to come and stay dwell at his house, despite who he was and what he'd done. The crowd wasn't happy, though. They muttered and grumbled amongst themselves, even as they followed Jesus to Zacchaeus' house. Jesus has gone to be a guest of a sinner. And even as Jesus entered Zacchaeus' house, the crowd hung around the courtyard watching and muttering. 
And here, think of houses in warm countries, not houses here. Warm countries, especially in villages and so on, where there's no glass in the windows and people live most of their life outdoors and uh, it's pretty easy to overhear conversations. You can't hide yourself away from people. How could Jesus eat with and stay at the home of a sinner, a tax collector, a chief tax collector? The Torah, the laws of God given to, the, to us long ago through Moses are clear. They murmured to each other. You must make sure you stay ceremonially clean if you want to go to synagogue to worship and be in God's presence. How can Jesus really be the promised one the prophets speak of if he so blatantly goes against the worship rules and rituals set out by God himself so long ago? And Zacchaeus, hearing them, knew they had a point. After all, he had become wealthy and powerful through taking advantage of his fellow Jews and charging them more than required by Roman law. He had always justified it because it was what all tax collectors did. It was expected. But now with Jesus sitting in his home with him, he realized suddenly that he had to make it right. And Zacchaeus stood up and said to Jesus with an earshot of the crowd, Look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Four times the amount. This was not an arbitrary number. It was the amount stated in God's law that was required to provide restitution when someone had cheated or stolen from someone else. And Jesus said to Zacchaeus, Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is the son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek and save the lost. Here ends the account of Zacchaeus and Jesus. Jesus stayed one night. One night. But this encounter changed Zacchaeus forever forever and completely from the inside out. It was all-encompassing, affecting every part of who he was and how he lived. Jesus had come, looked directly at him, called him by name, and knowing Zacchaeus' well-deserved reputation of being a cheat and a swindler, one who oppressed people and made life hard for them, he still said, I must come to your house. In that culture, it was a very real thing to become unclean yourself when you associated with someone who was unclean. This wasn't a small thing that Jesus did. And yet Jesus did say, I have to stay at your house. To enter into your life, Zacchaeus, your messy, unclean, mixed up life, because I have come to seek and save the lost. And to seek and save the lost, Jesus is willing to enter in, to dwell with the lost and associate with them and love them. Though the word love isn't used in this particular passage. Zacchaeus' reputation was well deserved, but Jesus did not say, Clean up your life, live the way you should, and then I will dwell with you. No, Jesus went to Zacchaeus' house, ate with him, stayed with him, listened to him, made himself unclean for the sake of Zacchaeus, for he came to seek and save the lost. Jesus gifted him with his presence, his acceptance, his salvation. And this filled Zacchaeus with so much joy and peace that it changed him. And I'm sure he didn't understand all the theological ins and outs 
about everything that had happened to him that day, I am absolutely sure he couldn't have explained it. But he didn't need to. He knew that he was different. He knew that he somehow had been made right with God because of Jesus. And his heart was filled with joy and peace and hope. Despite everything, God wanted to be in relationship with him and his world filter. It changed how he interacted with people, how he did business, what he did with his resources. And all he could think about was making things right as he had made, been made right with God. But what about the crowd? What's their response? It's clear that the crowd is an important character in, the, in this story. And I'm just saying one character because it's just the crowd. This isn't a private moment between Jesus and Zacchaeus. Jesus wants the crowd to understand what's going on, to recognize their own lostness as well. Were they happy Zacchaeus was found? Were they happy for Zacchaeus' repentance and willingness to make amends? That salvation had come to him? Did they now accept him into their midst? Did they better understand what the salvation Jesus came to bring was really all about? Or did they stay blind to their own lack of understanding of the Torah, of God, and how and why the promised one was to come? Did they stay blind to their own self-righteousness and arrogance and lack of love? And what about us today? Where do you find yourself in the story? Who do you identify with? Zacchaeus, the crowd, Jesus? Over this past week, I've been more and more convicted to ask these questions, and these are questions that I'm asking of myself. What questions... God may be asking you, Jesus may be asking you of yourself, could be different. Is Jesus in every room of my house, my life, my heart? Or have I sidelined him and stuffed him in a closet somewhere? Or locked a particular door so he can't enter into that part? In what ways am I living like Zacchaeus and causing harm to someone else? on an individual level, or how about a societal level? You know, I heard on the radio the other day that 20% of the world's population is over, uses over 70% of the world's resources. I am part of that 20%. And I too like a bargain, and to have all the trappings of a middle-class life, but at what cost to those in other parts of the world? In what ways am I a member of the crowd what people have I written off because I think they're too far from the right way of living? Perhaps certain political leaders, if I'm really honest, or certain groups of people who call themselves Christians, but I disagree with how they live and how they interpret scripture. People who I no longer think are really worth being in relationship with. In what ways am I blind to my own self-righteousness and arrogance? In what ways have I missed the reality of my own lostness? And then I found myself asking, in what ways am I like Jesus, willing to step into the messiness of people's lives and be in relationship with them without judgment? Turns out I find myself in all three characters of the story. Where do you find yourself? And you know, perhaps this morning you don't find yourself in any of these characters. Perhaps you might find yourself more in the brief account that's just before this one. The blind man who was begging Jesus to heal him. Perhaps you find yourself more in that account. But wherever you find yourself this morning, Jesus is saying your name. Jesus is saying, I must stay at your house. Think about that. Sit with that. Jesus is saying, 
I know what's going on in your life. I know the mess. I know what's underneath everything. And I still want to come and dwell in your house. Will we welcome him? Will we dare open ourselves up and welcome him, or re-welcome him, perhaps, into the mess of our lives? And in so doing, also experience the joy of his presence, the peace of his presence. And I can't remember one of the lines of the song that David said, but it made fit really well. <laughs> Jesus is welcoming us this morning in whatever situation we find ourselves, and saying, come, come to me. I must stay at your house today. And as we come to the table of the Lord this morning, we're going to celebrate communion. May we truly know the joy that Zacchaeus experienced. And this joy isn't, you know, this, uh, oh, we're so happy and bubbly necessarily. This deep-seated sense that we are right with our Creator. No matter what is going on in our lives, in the world, somehow we are right and can be at peace. And may we also come in humility with a willingness to be completely changed by the dwelling of Jesus in our hearts. And the fact is, is that when Jesus comes and dwells in us, we are never the same. We are changed. Can't help it. Jesus changes us and makes us more and more and more to become like him. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, as we come to your table today, help us to say, yes, Jesus, come and stay at my house. And Lord, help us to experience your, the joy of your presence your love in our lives. Pray this in your name. Amen. Um, as uh, David plays our song of um, response and preparation, I invite uh, Pastor Aaron, do you mind letting them know, uh, the children, that we're...